For years, The Tonight Show starring Johnny Carson was the ultimate late night tastemaker and pretty much the only real game in town. But then, the 1990s ushered a golden age of late night comedy that shaped the television landscape for generations to come. So, today we're channel flipping through the late night talk show wars of the 90s. But before we get started, be sure to subscribe to the Weird History Channel. After that, leave a comment and let us know what other showbiz topics you would like to hear about next. Okay, here's Weird History! Johnny Carson took over as the host of The Tonight Show from Jack Parr in 1962, so he wasn't the show's first host, but for a generation of comedians, he was the show's ultimate host. He retired in 1992, handing his chair over to comedian Jay Leno. That decision famously sent Carson's spurned friend, David Letterman, to rival network CBS to create his own show, The Late Show with David Letterman. Spoiler alert, he did just fine. In 2005, Carson passed away. Soon after, on an episode of The Late Show, Letterman delivered his usual laugh-filled opening monologue, and then revealed it had been written by Carson. Since he had retired, Carson had been sending Letterman jokes to use in any monologues. A world-class comedian to the end. But Leno hadn't been handed the gig out of the blue. He was a veteran comedian who had previously served as a guest host on The Tonight Show, and he would soon have a chance to prove himself in a crisis. During an appearance on The Tonight Show, legendary comedian Rodney Dangerfield seemed ever so slightly off his game, but it would take someone who knew his act intimately to notice. That someone was Tonight Show host Jay Leno, who had known Dangerfield for years. As it turns out, Dangerfield actually was suffering a mini-stroke. As Leno later recalled, I know Rodney and I know his act, and his movements were off. As he was doing his stand-up, I told our producer, I think Rodney's having a stroke or heart attack. Call the paramedics. Leno's decision to have the producers get help saved the comedian. And while Rodney would recover, he still got no respect. When Jay Leno took over from Johnny Carson as host of The Tonight Show, he had some awfully big shoes to fill. And leaving along with Carson was his longtime sidekick, Ed McMahon, also a legend. So as Leno went about making the show his own, he reached out to Phil Hartman about possibly filling the sidekick role. Hartman was already considering leaving Saturday Night Live in 1991, since his friend and collaborator Jan Hooks had just left the show. But ultimately, Hartman decided to stay at SNL, where he was the sketch show's go-to Bill Clinton impersonator. As for Leno, he would ultimately get actor, voiceover man, and former Letterman production assistant Ed Hall to replace Ed McMahon. Well, as if anyone could ever replace Ed McMahon. Letterman has said and done a lot of wacky things on his show, but nothing quite as wacky as that time when the host took a moment to spill the beans on a real-life extortion plot, of which he was the target. The comedian and talk show host has long been known for his bizarre sense of humor, so you could be forgiven for thinking it was just a strange joke. Even the audience wasn't completely sure whether he was telling the truth or setting up a big punchline. But it was very real. Letterman had found a box in the back seat of his car containing evidence of him engaging in sexual relationships with members of his staff, along with a note threatening to expose him. The blackmailer demanded $2 million, threatening to write both a screenplay and a book exposing Letterman's secrets if they didn't receive the money. If that particular threat makes you instantly suspect the blackmailer was a writer, then congratulations, detective! The blackmailer, Joe Halderman, was a writer and producer of the true crime journalism series 48 Hours. Maybe he wanted to star in his own episode. Letterman worked with police to deliver the blackmailer a fake check, which led to Halderman's arrest. Letterman then confessed on air that the information the blackmailer had was accurate. He had been involved in inappropriate relationships with members of his staff. His reputation took a hit, but audiences quickly forgave him. In 1993, comedian Bill Hicks was famous for his biting social commentary and his take-no-prisoners approach. Still, it was no less shocking when he was censored by CBS and had his routine cut from a broadcast of The Late Show with David Letterman, the first time a comedy act had ever been censored at CBS's Ed Sullivan Theater. 
So, what did Hicks say that was so bad it had to be cut from the show? Well, the comedian riffed on a number of sensitive issues, including abortion and the Bible. And while his comments probably wouldn't be considered that incendiary today, network television in 1993 was a different story. By now, you're probably asking which foolish network executive made the decision to pull the now legendary Hicks set from broadcast. Well, get ready to welcome our next guest, Surprising Revelation because it was actually Letterman himself who made the decision not to air the set. On the top 10 list of things we didn't expect, that was number one, Dave. Letterman was unaware Hicks had recently been diagnosed with cancer, and the comedian tragically passed away only four months later. In 2009, Letterman invited Hicks's mother onto the show to apologize for his decision, and finally air the routine in its entirety. When Conan O'Brien was first announced as the heir apparent of Late Night after David Letterman departed for his own show on CBS, the whole world came together as one to say, who? Though he's well known today, the lanky redhead had been mostly behind the scenes working as a writer on Saturday Night Live and The Simpsons. In fact, O'Brien was criticized mercilessly during his first few years on the job and was constantly the target of rumors that he'd be replaced. But one of those early negative reviews was actually written by O'Brien himself. After his first episode, O'Brien, a master of self-effacing humor, penned an op-ed piece making fun of himself and his show in the New York Times. His quick wit and genial charm eventually won people over, and he stuck around in the job for almost 28 years. For a period in the early 90s, the Arsenio Hall show was the hottest thing in late night. It was the hip new show that had cool guests and appealed to younger viewers, even if it did have to deal with the occasional Steven Seagal. The Arsenio Hall show was so popular, it may have helped swing an election. In 1992, when the show was hitting its pop culture stride, presidential hopeful Bill Clinton appeared as a guest. After his interview, Clinton threw on a pair of sunglasses and jammed with a house band playing Heartbreak Hotel on a saxophone. Many Americans of both parties agreed it was the coolest thing a presidential candidate had ever done. And it, combined with an MTV appearance two weeks later, coincided with a sharp rise in Clinton's polling numbers against Ross Perot and the incumbent George H.W. Bush, both of whom he would eventually defeat. Hmm, Bush should have thought about picking up a skateboard. Before he became one of the key faces of political comedy as the host of The Daily Show, Jon Stewart was a very different kind of television personality. In fact, when David Letterman left NBC for CBS in 1993, Stewart was on the short list of contenders to replace him. That job eventually went to Conan O'Brien, and Stewart instead went to host MTV's first foray into late-night talk show programming, The Jon Stewart Show. The show was a hit and eventually made its way from MTV to syndication as a replacement for the Arsenio Hall show. However, the show's youthful vibe didn't carry over from the cable network, and it was soon canceled. Stewart bounced back, though, and secured himself a role in the hit Adam Sandler comedy Big Daddy. Oh, and a gig as the new host of The Daily Show, becoming one of the most influential political commentators of his era. Yes. NBA superstar Irvin Magic Johnson had a late-night talk show, and he did not have an easy time transitioning from the court to the stage. In fact, from the start, his 1998 show, The Magic Hour, was a complete fiasco, although that's admittedly a great title. Johnson didn't have any interview skills or even much chemistry with his sidekick, Craig Shoemaker, so he appeared understandably nervous, which is not the best vibe for a fun talk show. The Magic Hour was mocked mercilessly by shock jock Howard Stern on his radio show. So in response, Stern was booked as a guest. This turned out to be one of the biggest mistakes in the history of television. Johnson sat back timidly while Stern took control of the interview. He asked inappropriate questions about Johnson's HIV diagnosis and advised the basketball star to speak Ebonics, a controversial term negatively referring to African-American vernacular English. Stern turned his attention to Johnson's co-hosts, asking where the recently fired shoemaker was and harassing band leader Sheila E., insisting she remove her shirt to improve ratings. In other words, Howard Stern behaved like Howard Stern. It was one of the most difficult to watch episodes in the history of Late Night, and the magic hour was canceled soon after. The moral of the story is, don't invite Howard Stern anywhere, unless you really want Howard Stern to show up.
If you ask someone to name the most iconic host of The Daily Show, odds are they'll say John Stewart. And if you ask someone to name the host of The Late Late Show, it's probably going to be Craig Ferguson. But before either of those hosts took over their respective shows, Craig Kilborn was at the helm of them both. The man who was born to be replaced got his start in sports, serving as an anchor on ESPN Sports Center. He then moved to Comedy Central in 1996 to launch The Daily Show, and moved to The Late Late Show on CBS in 1998. Kilborn departed that show in 2004, tossing the keys to Scottish comedian and actor Ferguson, who at the time was best known in the States for his role on The Drew Carey Show. The next future late night star is probably watching to see what show Kilborn starts and leaves next. Both The Late Show with David Letterman and Late Night with Conan O'Brien debuted in 1993 and went on to be massive successes. But not everything that debuted that year did so well. If you don't believe us, just ask Chevy Chase. Yes, 1993 was also the year the Saturday Night Live legend stepped into the late night host seat with his own talk show, which reviews called embarrassing and was canceled after just six weeks. Chase's decades-long reputation as being difficult to work with may explain why he struggled as a late-night host and was unable to connect with his guests and viewers. But the speed with which the show was pulled from the air, even after Fox racked up $3 million in ad buys for the first few episodes, was unexpected. Turns out, Chase wasn't Fox's first choice either. When the network initially went searching for a host for its foray into late-night, it approached country music sensation Dolly Parton. She politely declined and suggested Chase instead. Talk about going from 9 to 5. So what do you think? Were you a fan of late night TV in the 90s? Let us know in the comments below. And while you're at it, check out some of these other videos from Our Weird History.